Russians, I believe, was the title of the series. And so during work, I listened to YouTube videos and, you know, knowing that the series is on worship, I was pulling up all sorts of things. <laughs> and so I came across this sermon, and let me tell you, sometimes you may think something is a mistake. However, I think God has better plans. Yes. yes Amen. Amen. So when I forwarded this video to my husband and my son, hence the reason why I'm here. <laughs> He says to me, he says, oh, I think that you should preach this weekend. Oh, That's yeah. when that was, that he told me that I should preach this weekend. <laughs> no, it was probably Wednesday. I think it was Wednesday. Or Thursday, <laughs> something like that. But, but I do work a full-time job. And um, so I am sitting there, and I'm thinking to myself, why do I worship? This, this title, this sermon title is the object of my worship. So I'm the worship leader. I should know why I worship, right? I am the wife of the lead pastor and the mother of the co-pastor. I really should know why I worship. I've been serving uh, God for years <laughs> and and so I should know and I started really looking and listening to their lots and lots of different things so I want to tell you a story this morning okay let me tell you a story it's no ordinary tale no it's the ordinary from which every other story fails it's the story of God it's the story of history and I'm not the author no, the author is a glorious mystery. See, long before he put pen to paper, long before there was time, or before there was even matter, he was there, all alone. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. One God in three persons, everlasting in existence. Completely satisfied, needing absolutely nothing. He was happy in himself. His joy was overflowing. The Son in the arms of his holy, righteous Father, and the Spirit overshadowing, all glorifying one another. So why would this God even bother to create the fountain of all happiness? How can you improve upon this state? Well, the joy within itself, welling up at such capacity, was so full it must be shared with a glorious society. So the mighty author, quill in hand, to share his infinite mind, his love, his joy sat down to write his once upon a time. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and he made all things to reflect his beauty and his worth. Mountains, rivers, oceans, trees, all gladly testifying, endless stars and galaxies declare his glory shining. Amen. He made it all, and it was good, and to culminate his work, he fashioned man and breathed to life his special ball of dirt. Man came to life with blinking eyes and welcomed by God's face. They walked with him every day and night. There was peace and no such thing as shame. God said, be fruitful, fill the earth, and eat from any tree except this one, because if you do, you'll surely fall from me. No, why do this? Why give this choice? Because he is writing a story. And he's about to show to the world, the whole world, the fullness of his Amen. glory. Yes. Conflict enters early on in the script and with a snake in the garden doing what he does best, Ron and his lip. <laughs> Flashback to when this evil was created, his was an angel of light. Who fell when his head got inflated. <laughs> Banished from God and from this endless mercy, he came down to earth to tempt us with the unworthy. Ooh. So there in the garden, an ordinary day, he came to the woman and said, Did God really say that you should not eat from every tree in the garden? He must not want your happiness or you would have 
total freedom. So pridefully they listened and sinfully they took and scorned their creator and they ate the forbidden fruit. Injustice, this, my friends, this is injustice. That God should be seen and then traded as a nothing. That man should completely forfeit his joy and dig for fleeting desires in the gutter. Fallen now is all mankind and sure to face its judgment. A world of pain, of toil and strain and hell forever after. But God would make promise to it, preserve himself a people, and through the brokenness of man, oh, there would shine a hero. The plot line continues, some character development, and all supporting actors, well, all fantastic in embellishment. Noah found favor in God's holy sight, and when God sent the floods, he mercifully spared his life. Yeah. We come to Abraham, and God made him a covenant, and he said, I will bless you and make your offspring abundant. Yeah. To Isaac and to Jacob, God would come and do the same, and though many dangers came to threaten his perfect plan, the story would go on. With the author's full control, he would lead his people yeah. everywhere that they should go. Flash forward now for a hundred years in Egypt, there's a pharaoh who doesn't like God's people growing numerous in freedom. So he made them slaves, but God came down and chose his servant Moses. A burning bush, a call to go. His presence was his promise. Go and tell that pharaoh now to let my people go so they can freely worship me in the place that I will show. Plagues numerous. God would show them that he is the I am. That Pharaoh's rule is like a pawn in his glorious hand. Amen. The waters part, the millions leave and follow their great Savior. He guided them, provided for them. They could not obey these rules. They tried, they failed, they tried, they failed. They bowed to worship idols and then they bow again to God. They said to God, give us a king that we will make things better. God, their rightful king, assured them this would be a fetter. They insisted, God relented, gave to them their king. Some were good, led them to him. Some brought idolatry. Then came prophets, turned back to God. Sometimes the people listened, but mostly they gave a God because they wanted to be him. God will not wink at your sin, the prophets would say. The people rose to eat and drink, and then they'd go. God finally seemed to have enough and brought a blurring quiet. The prophets ceased. The people waited for a hundred years mm -hmm. of silence. Enter our protagonist. Most unannounced, the plot is quickly rising. Who is this guy? Nobody really knows. He's meek. He's humble. An ordinary hero. But the craziest thing about this character is, well unlike the other characters, this is the author himself. Yes. His name was Jesus. He was born of a virgin, fully God. He was perfect, fully man. He was learned. Different from all the others, but he tempted just the same in every single way we are without a single sin. Amen. He made the lame to jump and he caused the blind to see. And unlike the other religious leaders, he had some because he came from high, and he came to redeem, not to be served, but to serve his haters and his enemies. Wow. He loved, he gave, he showed his heart of the author, claimed no glory for himself, because he came here from the Father. We hated him for it, because we wanted to be God. Despised and rejected, we esteemed him. Conflict escalating now. It starts with a betrayal. Judas hoards his eternal Lord for 30 pieces of silver. A final meal of prayer, and then they head into the garden where Jesus sweat with drops of blood, preparing for the pardon. The soldiers took the Lord away. He led them to a trial. Are you the Son of God? They say, I am. There's no denying, except, of course, for his disciples who left their Lord alone. Jesus looked up to the sky, and here he was, alone. 
They led him to the praetorium and then began to beat him. Who hit you, they would shout and say, Oh, Father, please forgive them. He made his, they made his back a bloody mess. They whipped him till he lost his breath. They threw the cross upon his wounds. The weight of sin, 300 pounds. The great eternal Lord of all, the author of all things, now like a lamb unto the slaughter. Would this be his defeat? They nailed him to the rugged cross. They shouted, where is your God? He said, have you forsaken me? He takes a breath. His final three, it's finished, the Savior's cry, and then he bowed his head. The author of all life, the Lord of all, the Son of God, is dead. They laid his body in the tomb, and everything was quiet, as God people find themselves again in everlasting silence. Two days passed. On the second morning after Jesus died, Mary went to the tomb to take a look inside. And when she arrived, she was meted, met by an angel. So she fell to the ground, but he said, there's no danger. This Jesus, Jesus, is he the one that you see? Mary, he's not here. He is risen indeed. Yeah. Climax is true. Every good story has one. But this part is where you feel the moment, the momentum slightly shifting. Mary sprints to go, tell the disciples, the Lord, he's alive. And Peter and John go, but they see for themselves, there's nothing there inside. Perhaps he truly lives. Then Jesus' words came flashing to mind. They will kill the Son of Man, but after three days, he will rise. Momentum is surely building now, and the enemy is limp, and Jesus finds the twelve, and then he gives to them the mission. All authority is mine, all in heaven and on earth. Go tell them I'm alive. Go and tell the whole wide world. And don't get slack. I'm coming back. Yeah. <laughs> As now, the church is born. Amen. The Holy Spirit given. Yeah, and the yeah. news of Jesus, like of a contagious sickness, is now it's spreading. Thousands saved. A mighty wind is blowing through the region. And the promise God gave to Abraham, we're finally seeing to it. Yeah. Repentance is, and forgiveness is preached. And all in the name of Jesus. Sinners and saints alike proclaim our God has come to Amen. save us. The Gentiles hear the story and the news is blowing up. The plan is working. The gospel spreading from Asia to Africa. Martyrs laying down their lives because they know the story is true. It's a story like no other. It's a movement you cannot undo. Constantine tried to slow it down and turn it into steeples, but an angry monk from Germany wrote some holy thesis. It spreads like fire, then it came to America by sail, and here we are, the 21st century. The gospel cannot fail. It's the greatest story that's ever been told, written by the greatest author the whole world has ever known. But there's still some coming, yes? There's still some coming. Yeah, right. See, go was the command. To every tribe and nation Amen. and carry to this great story, this dying generation. Because yeah. when the gospel is finally spread across this whole earth, then we're going to hear a trumpet sound and Jesus will return. Yeah. Heaven will be opened and a white horse shall appear. And the one who sits upon it, all his enemies will fear. His eyes will be like fire and his purpose full of glory. Justice for all evil, life. For all who love this story. He'll come to judge the quick, the dead, and all who've trod this earth. Every knee will bow, and yes. every tongue will confess yes. that Jesus Christ yes. is Lord. Yes. Death and Hades, he will throw into the lake of fire, yes. and say yes. to yes. that serpent foe, that coward, that old liar. The church will rise, surround the throne, and clothed in glory his. With every nation, tribe, and tongue, we will worship him. Amen. Singing, worthy, worthy is the Lamb, the Lamb who was slain, blessing and glory and honor forever to his name. And for ages and ages, we will sing the praises of our God and King. Amen. It's the greatest story that's ever been told by the greatest author the whole world has known. The bad guys lose and the good guys win. Jesus is Lord of all the end. Yeah. So, my friends, the object of my worship. I'm going to tell you 
you a little more about that journey that I took coming to this moment, the object of my worship. I watched videos. There were several by Louis Giglio that I watched. I went back, you know, and I don't know if you've ever watched How Great Is Our God, Laminin. Awesome. Reminds me, I mean, the glory of God. Think about God, the creator of the universe. How vast and big, right? When you think about the sun and the, 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 the vast galaxies and the stars. I mean, in this video, he even talks about how big these things are. And then he gets out a little golf ball. And he says that the earth is the size of a golf ball compared to the massive size of some of these galaxies. Wow. And you know what? God sees you and I here. The word says that he holds the galaxies in his hands. Think about how big God is. Yeah. How massive, how wonderful. Well, then there was one, a Worship Central Conference. You know, that was good. And Worship was the title of this sermon. He was at Hillsong, you know, giving a sermon, and that was, like, awesome. And then there was one that said, I saw the Lord, and it was based on Isaiah 6. And it says, out of that whole thing, I can get up in the morning, and I've been saying this since I watched it. I'm not dead. See, I'm not dead like dead in the ground, dust in a in a you know a, a casket where people have seen me and and I, they dress me up and they do all that stuff. No, that's not the kind of dead we're talking about. The dead we're talking about is the fact that I was spiritually dead. Yes. So when I get up in the morning. When I lay my head down at night, I can truly say, glory to God, I'm not dead. Mm -hmm. Woo! Why, worship? Why is he the object of my worship? Right? His massiveness, how big he is, that yet he still knows me, and yet then I'm not dead because Amen. I should be. I deserved it. We deserved death. Then there was one called Stun by God, and it about knocked me off my Easter. <laughs> stunned by God. And the three points in that sermon were stunned, seared, and sent. Again, out of Isaiah. And how the fact that Isaiah is there, he's in there, he comes up, and all of a sudden he sees the Lord, right? And the next thing he sees is an angel, and he thinks, woe is me. I am done. But that's not it. The angel comes with the coal and these things that look like tongues. And again, I think if I saw that thing, I would probably think, okay, I'm gone. This is it. <laughs> I'm dead. This, yeah. is, uh, this is it. And uh, But no, that's not the plan. It wasn't that God was coming to put him down. Mm -hmm. That's right. What was he coming? He was coming to purify him. Yes. See now that all your iniquities have been forgiven. Yes. Whoo! I'm not dead. Yeah. The object of my worship. Yeah. And then there was the last one. This is the last one I want to talk about. Is symphony. In Isaiah 40, or not Isaiah, Psalms, because there's no 148 chapters. <laughs> Wrong one. I, <laughs> okay, Psalm 148. Get this. i got to read this to you guys. If you have your Bibles and you want to turn to it, you can. I'm going to be in the most holy version, as you know. I'm going to be in the Amplified. And it says this. 100 and, oops, one more. 48. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his hosts. Now remember, this is this is like this is the order, right? So it's all the angels, all the hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you stars of light. The stars mm -hmm. and the planets mm -hmm. sing to him. Mm -hmm. They sing. They glorify him. There's a symphony beginning. 
The stars and the moon and the sun, they're all singing to him. And think about it. Now, I know we don't ever hear it. But in the springtime, when the flowers open, what do you think they say? They make a pop, right? They're praising God. When the wind blows and the trees, they sway and the leaves, they rustle. When the crickets are cricketing, when the frogs are croaking, right? When all of that happens, they're singing a song, right? Okay, and all of us have heard the whale song, right? At one time or another, we've all heard, you know, on National Geographic or something like that, we've heard about the whales and the songs that they sing. Well, they say, scientists say, that they're just calling their mates, and that makes them know where they're supposed to go every year to return to mate and have their young, right? Oh, no. They're singing yeah. to God. And they're praising him, right? Let's look. I mean, it says so right here. Praise him, you highest heavens, and you waters above the heaven. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded, and they were created. Oh, for he go. commanded. Yeah. He also established them forever and ever, and he made a decree which shall not pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth. You see monsters and all the deep. There they are. The whales. Mm -hmm. You lightning, hail, fog, and frost. Whoever thought that hail and a snowstorm were crazy? <laughs> I don't know, but they are. <laughs> yep. You lightning, you stormy wind, fulfilling his orders. Mountains and all hills, fruitful trees and cedars, beasts and all cattle, creeping things and flying birds. Mm -hmm. Ain't no rock gonna cry out my name. Yeah. Ain't no bird going to flap his wings, right, and sing a song in my name. Kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and rulers and judges of the earth, both young, young men and maidens, old men, that must be you. <laughs> and children. <laughs> Let them praise and exalt the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted and supreme. His glory and majesty are above all earth and heaven. Amen. So think about this. Everything is singing this song, and we get to join in. Amen. How yeah. great yeah. is our God. Yeah. How mighty. Sing with me how great is our God. If you look that one up, it's really cool. I wish there was some way that I could have played it, but look that one up. Chris, uh, it's Louis Giglio Symphony. Well, then, after all of that's ruminating in my, my being, right, and it's going, oh, God, what do you want me to say? Now, you know, we are the age of technology, right? Yeah. <clears throat> so I thought, well, let's look up a definition, or let's look up sermons on worship, and all these kind of things. So I read stuff from um, Shane and Sheen did a, a worship initiative, and there's several um, recordings that they've done. Well, then, this um, Desiring God, which is John Piper, his organization, they wrote some short little, you know, devotions on some of the different songs. Okay, God, that's not quite it yet. All right. And then I thought, well, definition. What's the word, the, the, the definition of worship, right? So there's Webster's Dictionary. That was good. Then there's Bible study tools. Yeah. Right? And boy, let me tell you, now you see how little that is? There's pay, there's like all this stuff about worship, and, and I'm thinking, oh God, I am undone. What am I going to preach on? I got I to gotta share this. And of course, then I thought about, well, that, that little poem, that word that I shared, you know, the story, that was written by Matt Papa. And you can look that up on YouTube, too. It's a great tool. Let me tell you. And then, so many scripture verses. So how do I cram all of that into 30 minutes? And here we are. When did I start? <laughs> it's 11.30 almost. And I think I've probably gone way past it. But then there's all these scriptures that tell us. And so I thought, like the mom that I am, I thought, why do I worship? Because. Ask my kids. They've heard that many times. Because I said so. <laughs> because. Why do I worship? Because. He is great. Yes. And it kept rhyming me over and over in me. There's a symphony, sing, a symphony singing how wonderful it is. His majesty fills the earth. And I'm not dead. Yeah. That's why I worship. Yes. Well, 
I worship because the God who created all of us can accept the baby cross. And he knows where I am on the cross. Yeah. And he hears me. With everything else that's going on, all the praise, he hears me. And he knows me. I worship him because God knew even before he created all of this, they knew that we would fall. Yes. That Adam and Eve would fall. Mm -hmm. And they have to have a plan. And they have that plan. And the word tells us that Jesus was slain from the foundations right. even before in the beginning God. Wow. I worship because he knew that was going to happen. They knew that was going to happen and yet they still did. Because I'm not dead. Because of the symphony. And because of Revelation. Chapter 5. Yeah. And if you um, want to turn there. Yeah. Verses 9 through 10. Or I'm sorry, 9 through 12. I think is where I am. And again, the most holy version. That's right. That's right. The, and what page are we on? <laughs> Revelation chapter 5. That's page 1,484. <laughs> okay. I'm going to start in verse 1. And I saw lying on the open hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll, a book, written with and on the back, closed and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel announcing in a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll? And who deserves and is morally fit to break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to take a single look at its contents. And I wept audibly and bitterly because no one was found fit to open the scroll or to inspect it. Then the one of, then one of the elders said to me, Stop weeping. See, the Lord of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has won. He has overcome and conquered. He can open the scroll yeah. and break right. its seven seals. Amen. Hallelujah. And there between those, there between the throne and the four were the four living creatures, one beings and and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing, and as, as though as it had been slain, with seven horns, with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, who have been sent into all the earth. Then he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders prostrated themselves before the Lamb. Each was holding a harp, and they had golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people Amen. and the saints. Verse 9. And now they sing a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to break the seals that are on it. For you were slain and sacrificed, and with your blood... You purchased men unto God from every tribe yeah. and language yeah. and people and nation. Yeah. And you have made them a kingdom, a royal race, and priests to our God. And they shall reign as kings over all the earth. Amen. Then I looked and I heard the voices of many angels on every side of the throne and the living creatures and the elders. And they had numbered 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Deserving is the Lamb who was sacrificed to receive all the power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and majesty, glory and splendor and blessing. And I heard every created thing in heaven and on earth and under the earth on the sea and all that is in it, crying out together to him who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb be 
ascribed the blessing and the honor and the majesty, glory and splendor and power, might and dominion forever and ever. Yes, amen. Why do I worship? What is the object of my worship? It is Jesus, the Lamb that was slain, whose blood purchased our salvation, our freedom. Amen. Hmm. So a song that's going to go on for eternity. Yes. The thought that the creator, the author of the story, would be mistreated the way he was mistreated, mm -hmm. beaten and bruised and hung on a cross, his blood shed, his father turning his face away because he could not look upon the sin that he took upon himself for you and me. Mm -hmm. It's not something that you could possibly imagine or think, and it was it, this, this act that he did in a dramatic way showed his love for you and me. His love. So the Son of God was sent to save his people from their sin. This sacrifice. And because he did that, we are now God's children. Yeah. We have the wonderful privilege and honor to call him Father. He did it for the world's ransom. Not just for me, not just for white people. He did it for brown people. He did it for African. I mean, he did it for the whole world. You think about the heavens. You look here, and this is only just a yeah. just a, a little bitty glimpse of what heaven is going to look like because it's not just for one group of people, it's for every tribe, tongue nation, people group, for everyone. And in our scene, I mean, in our scene here, they were all around the throne. Hallelujah. Saying, worthy, holy, wonderful, how great you are. We were loving and adoring him yes. for what he did. So let me ask you this this morning. Last week, we wrote down the things that we felt might be holding us back from worshiping God on a piece of paper, right? Remember, we came up and we put them in that little shredder thing, right? Getting rid of it, getting rid of it. The things that we thought were holding us back from worshiping God. We also sang a song, we played this video, called Clear the Stage. And I want to read part of this song to you. It's part of the, they call it a bridge, but it says, we must not worship something that's not even worth it. Clear the stage, make some space for the one who deserves it. Anything I put before my God is an idol. And anything that I want with all my heart is an idol. Anything I can't stop thinking of is an idol. Yes. Anything that I give all my love is an idol. So let's bow our heads. What I want to ask is what are you worshiping this morning? What are you, what am I, putting before God today? What am I thinking about constantly? What am I giving all my love to? Because those things, my friends, those are idols. And the creator of the universe the Savior of the world. He is God this morning. 
So I'm going to challenge you this morning. Let's get rid of those idols. Let's get rid of those idols. Holy Spirit, what are you saying to us this morning? Holy Spirit, I know that you've spoken to each one of us here that we're not here by mistake. That it was planned <laughs> before the, the world was even created. This moment here, you knew it was going to happen. So what are you saying, Lord? a moment, take some time, and let's pray. Whatever it is that the Holy Spirit has put his finger on this morning, because he's really good at that, whatever it is, let's come and give it to Jesus. Let's give it to the Father. Let's put it down. Let's get rid of it. And go out of here singing the song. Worthy, worthy is the Lamb. 